In the next one, it's in 1935, another hairdresser came on the scene, Jay Mortimer, opened the, absolutely the most modern and up-to-date hairdressing saloon in Gawler. Mr Mortimer offered electric clippers, electric hot water, face massaging and shampooing, and they were also the local agents for healing golden-voiced radio, no doubt the latest invention for locals to inspect. The shop was located in the Regal Buildings in Murray Street. Where's Regal Buildings? Cinema? Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so the old, the old cinema. Okay. Keith Martin was advertising permanent waving, full head of a ten and sixpence, and a half head of six and sixpence. So I'm not sure how you perm a half head. I guess that might be the top or something. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but it was six and six anyway. If you only wanted a half a head. Um, and the price of haircuts began to rise again after the depression where the prices fell by 33 and a third percent. One and six down to one shilling. They are now being raised by uh, uh, one and threepence. Um, and uh, it seems that hairdressers worked harder and longer than most other trades being available to the public for 65 hours a week in an age when the normal hours was 44 hours and employees demanding that they be reduced to 40 or 36 hours. So there was an awful lot of hours spent by those hairdressers. It seemed to be the pattern all along. I couldn't quite find out when they opened, but I, uh, they, I found out what the closing hours were, and uh, assuming they were you know, open at a reasonable time in the morning, they did a lot of hours in a week. And the secretary of the, the Master Hairdressing Association placed a notice in the bunyip that all hairdressers will charge one and threepence for haircuts as of Monday the 11th of May. So the, I just said the ACCC would have a amused at that today. And I can remember back in my time when there was a little little slip in the advertiser that haircuts will be going up as of next Monday. Um, so that's back in the late 60s and probably early early 70s. Um, the haircuts were one price uh, right throughout the state back in those days. It was only a small... I paid sixpence. Sixpence? Mm -hmm. You used to put a little box on the, on the, on the seat there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. there, you had to pay one Oh! Yeah. <laughs> Sixpence. Um, that's it. Um, oh, Johnny Rawling, yes. John Rawling died on March, in March uh, 1945. He was born in York, England in 1860 and commenced hairdresser and tobacconist in Gawler here in 1884. He'd been going for uh, 60 years as a hairdresser in town. And um, he passed away at his home in Todd Street after a short illness. Um, he, he arrived here in 1884 accompanied by his brother-in-law, James Ashton. Does that ring any bells with anybody, James Ashton? Very famous artist. Yep. And a teacher, a, a teacher of art as well. Um, in our shop there was a huge painting which was quite beautiful, a huge thing. Um, and uh, it was a James Ashton, but I didn't know much about it when I was there. Um, and uh, when the family sold me the business, the painting was the first thing that went out. Um, and uh, yeah, James Ashton was a very famous, very famous artist. Went out to where? To the family. Oh. <laughs> Across the road here somewhere, yeah. Um, and so that just goes on to talk about some of the things that, uh, uh, in the obituary that, that Johnny Rawling had done. And he left a widow, <laughs> Frances Rawling, and uh, she continued to run the business for a little while. In... Next one. Yeah, this is interesting. In 1946, Harold Weaver advised that he had reopened his service station and hairdressing saloon in Williston. The public could buy car tyres, cycle tyres, batteries, retreads and get a haircut at the same time. <laughs> and he had a large range of fancy goods, oils and razor blades. <laughs> so, uh, that, I assume that's Bricky Weaver uh, in, in Labberton. My dad. Your dad, yeah. Yep. Where, where was the shop in Williston? On the left, okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Well, that's a shop we need, the picture we need to get in the actual, yeah. Um, Keith Martin's daughter, the next one, please, yeah. Keith Martin, if you've got any more stories of that, that that's a, the perfect place to be able to put on to. To, to an addendum there, yeah, absolutely. Keith Martin's daughter Pauline was following her father's footsteps into the trade and seeking models for all classes of ladies' hairdressing in June 1946. At the same time, Keith 
Martin was advertising cold permanent waiving and promoted his phone number as 187. Um, when I said before that I was the, the last man standing, that's not quite true because Pauline Martin, or Pauline Norton as she is, is still living at Victor Harbour. Uh, I've been trying to contact her by phone for the last few weeks and no one's answering there, so I'm not quite sure what the problem is. But I did call in there about a year or so ago to see if I could get some more information. And uh, unfortunately, uh, I haven't been able to contact her this time, but I'll keep trying. Yeah, so she's, um, she has some... She didn't, she didn't work there for a long time, I don't think, because she got married and moved out to Roseworthy College. Uh, Brian Norton, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yep. No, I, I caught up with both of them about a year ago, and uh, yeah, that was, that was, that was fantastic. Um, and the next one is... Where was Keith um, Opposite where the car park is now is a Victory Square. Yeah. A, the car park in the middle of the main street. Alongside the shop. Yeah, alongside yeah. the grouse. We bought Martin's shop. Yep. 1963, I thought. Yeah. Made the Epico Cafe. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Yeah. 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 Mm. Uh, uh, one before that, you've got Francis Rawling. Go back. Uh, yeah. um, Mrs. Francis Rawling passed away in November '47, and Harold Moran took over the business of Rawling and Freak, which he ran until his death in 1973. So he was there for over 40 years. And. Herb Gwynn passed away in August of 1953, and this story appeared in the front page of the Bunyip, emphasising the esteem that he was held. Um, and uh, it talked about his death occurring on the Sunday. He was well known and respected. Uh, he died aged 67, but he had been a very, very keen sports person, Herb Gwynn, and, and a very great contributor to the community through sport and through flowers and uh, through a whole lot of other things. So he was not only a long time in hairdressing, but he was also uh, was for 47 years in hairdressing, but um, he also contributed to the community uh, quite a bit as well through, through other things. Um, and Fred, oh yeah, that's right, yeah, Fred, Fred Gwynn took over, go, go back one. Fred Gwynn took over his father's business following his death uh, and was renowned for sales of sporting goods, art and craft material, and tobacco goods along with a long-standing hairdressing business. The name of H.J. Quinn hairdresser remained on the door long after his death. Such was the institution established by Bert Quinn. I can remember going to Fred Quinn's shop. They're talking about the art and craft. I bought my first cigarettes there. That was cane that you could buy and cut them off. It was quite, quite economical. I used to smoke this cane, but it was quite warm after a while. Yeah, Hixie was there. He was around the corner. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, this is uh, the next one. Yeah, uh, Cooch on the on the 14th of uh, December 1954, uh, William Arthur Cooch passed away, and he was 73. Uh, so he had been that was in uh, 73. He spent a lot of his time in Gawler hairdressing. Um, in 1949, Bert had sold up in Alice Springs, ready for a move to Gawler after operating a hairdressing saloon up in Alice for 12 years. Yeah, next one. Yeah. And again. So in the early 1960s, Gawler had several long-term hairdressing businesses. Bert Cooch operated next to the Picture Theatre on Carlton Road. Ron Wosley completed his apprenticeship with Harold Moran. There's Ron. Uh, keep going, yep. Uh, with Harold Moran in the early 1950s and follow, following a riff with Harold. I never found out what that was about, but it must have been a good one. Um, he left to open his own business on the southern side of the South End Hotel. And Fred Gwynn was opposite the Town Hall and Keith Martin was in the twilight of his career opposite the G.J. Cole store, which is now that car park. Yeah. Yeah. Harold Moran was the proprietor of Rawling and Freak and he took on Neil Rowell as an apprentice. Neil followed straight on from Ron Wosley. Neil was heir apparent to the business, but his life was cut short by cancer and he died in April 1968, aged just 23. And I commenced my apprenticeship in May of 68, a month after Neil's passing, and completed it in 73. Harold Moran died in October that year and I took over the business for a further five years. 
and uh, I was only the fourth owner of the business in 93 years. So quite, quite incredible when I think back on it. I didn't know at the time until I'd actually done some research. And this, this era also saw the retirement of Keith Martin, Bert Cooch, Fred Gwynn, and the emergence of uh, Nick Sacosta. That's Nick's shop there up the top, uh, who opened on the corner of Finner Street and Murray Street. He engaged one apprentice, Tony Bombardieri, who eventually took over the business. Um, so that is, um, yeah, that was, that was Nick's shop. Ladies' hairdressers opening up included Shergus and Swartz and Diane, so on. Uh, Ron Wosley moved up to Bert Cooch's side upon Bert's retirement and the redevelopment of the picture theatre, and he always worked on his own. He passed away in 2007, age 75. Keith Martin worked part-time for Harold up until 1973, which is a period spanning 50 years, and maintained good health and a keen interest in community activities. He passed away in 1974, age 72. So I worked with uh, Keith in 73, so that was just about 50 years after he began. It was, uh, it was just incredible. Um, uh, now I look back, then I didn't, he was an old man, but <laughs> uh, now I look back and I really do appreciate the longevity and the time that the, some of these people had put in. They were quite, in, quite incredible. Um, there's a page here which I haven't covered uh, from Dave the Barber covering from, no, from 1983 up to the present, which is fantastic. Um, we're going to trends, the modern era. Um, here you go, you got more? Trends over, the, over 175 years. Styles have changed, but um, uh, a couple of world events. And this is, I've kind of made this up from experience. Um, someone might hold me down. Um, yeah, go next one. Um, the two world events changed the way in particular that men wore their hair. Back in the early days of Gawler, um, hair was generally longer, they had beards, so it was more of a trim. Um, and then come the First World War when hair had to be kept shorter uh, and the styling went right out. It was, it was more convenient, something that they could wash and not have to, to worry about, particularly when, when the soldiers were overseas. Um, no time for grooming. Uh, so short back and size was a preferred style and, and uh, shaving every few days at the hairdresser was, was almost the norm. Hairdressers used to do a lot of shaving back in those days and all the customers had their own cutthroat razors and, all, and their own brush and mug. And certainly on a Saturday night before they went out to the shindigs they'd be in there for their haircut and shave. So that was the tradition up until the 1960s, so for quite a, many decades when the music group called The Beatles set a new trend. And uh, the one that lasted 50 years. The Mop Tops, they, they were called. Um, they had a, uh, uh, a new style, as, as everyone is here is aware, uh, and that really did change the way we look today. Uh, in my time as a hairdresser, lots of rows. Lots, lots of rows where the, the son, the, the children wanted to have their hair longer, the father, after four or five decades of short hair, and his father before him, uh, no, it wasn't going to be. So uh, I had row after row after row. Uh, I had to please the father because he was paying, but I knew the lad was going to go to school next day and get castigated by the, by the people. Um, and uh, so I actually saw family breaking up over this. It was really quite, a, a, quite crude, it really, really was. Um, interestingly enough, brother, sister, relationships, quite often the girls would get around the father to allow the boys to have longer hair. So a lot of, lot of boys could thank their sisters uh, for, uh, for that um, and it was quite fascinating to watch. Uh, shaving shaving in the, um, died out in the late 50s and mid 60s uh, because when razors became more available for people to, uh, to use at home. I started in 68 and we were doing in the shop about two to three shaves a month, and I probably did about six or eight or so during my career. Didn't like it at all, it was horrible. <laughs> um, but uh, that, was the, that was the trade on that, you know, that was the, some people wanted it, so, uh, so we used to do it. And um, I still got, went through an old box that I took out of the shop when I left, and I've still got quite a few of the old cutthroats and strops and stones at home now, uh, which is quite fascinating to relive after all of those years. And I can remember Harold telling me, 
that uh, he would quite often have to go up to the hutch uh, and do the shaving up there, and sometimes before an operation, uh, shave the old people or shave, shave before the ops. And, uh, that was back in the, uh, the earlier, probably the 30, 40s, 30, 40s, 40s, yeah. Um, so uh, that was that. Um, and the new wave, just to finish up, um, Gawler today has a new wave of hairdressers carrying out the duties of the tons tonsorial artist um, as required by their 21st century customers but are blissfully unaware of the rich tapestry of history that's gone before them in the 19th and the 20th centuries. Um, will we ever see the longevity of Rawling and Freak, Harold and myself, spanning 93 years? Or Will Cooch, who opened in 1900 and was succeeded by his son Bert into the 1960s. Fred and, and Herb and Fred Gwynn operated for more than 50, and Keith Martin and Pauline for more than 50. And how many backyarders were there in Gawler during this time? There are probably plenty of people who are willing to try their hand and earn a few bob. I'd like to know who they were. And uh, finally, if you have uh, a story or experiences I've already mentioned, it would be great to be able to to do that. One thing I just, just thought of that I, it wasn't in here but um, it, was, it was one of uh, the weekly sales, it was Friday, people came down from all over the place um, as far as Clare, um, uh, Balaclava, um, even up think, from the Riverland um, and it was the place to find out how many inches of rain someone had had, how many bags to the acre someone had had, how much the sheep were taking, uh, and, and all of this sort of stuff. It was a real place for information sharing and gathering. And um, we, uh, they used to come in and you know, how, many, how many bags they're getting out at Freeling and how, uh, how's this happening. And so um, it was really quite uh, an interesting exercise to be the, the font of all knowledge of things happening in the agricultural world and I guess in some other, other ways as well because um, people used to confide in us. Uh, as uh, uh, We didn't really want to know it but people confided with us anyway. Uh, and so that was that. There's a few stories that I haven't put in there that I probably won't, um, but um, there's <laughs> uh, there was in in, um, in 1937. Uh, it was being taped. Oh, okay. Uh, there was a, a guy came to Harold. His name was John Mudra, um, and uh, he wanted his razor sharpened, so he, Harold sharpened it. And he came back and said, "Short, sure, sharp. Yes, it's sharp." And um, so with that he took it and went down to Gawler Arms Hotel and knelt over the bath and, and cut his throat. Um, and to this day, uh, Hal told me that in, in the 60s. Didn't tell me who it was, but through Trove I was able to look it up. Um, and to, for, for many years I think um, uh, the owners of the Gawler Arms always heard uh, knocking and and commotion in the middle of the night uh, and I was able to give them the answer to who it actually who it was it was Johnny who, uh, uh, who who did the job on himself back in back in 1937 so um, yeah so it's just those those little stories that um, that come from from years and years of, of being in the shop and uh, one one morning I an early early one Saturday morning I had a two guys come to see me for a haircut and they'd, they'd been on the terps all night uh, they guess they were about 20 or so um, and they'd really had a, had a good few drinks. Uh, and one of them became a father the night before, so they went out celebrating. So he's, and uh, within 20 minutes, they were both dead in a car accident. So that's a sort of you know, really, really sad that, um, that those sort of things that uh, you, in a hairdressing shop you get. And it was very uncanny how many times you'd cut someone's hair, an elderly person, uh, and the next week you're looking in the paper, <laughs> they're gone. <laughs> At least they went, went looking nice. But um, it was, <laughs> I'm sure it's nothing to do with a haircut, but uh, it was a sort of uh, uh, the things that, um, that you remember. It's, uh, uh, many, 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 many times that actually happened. So, yeah, I think that's, uh, that brings me to the end. Thank you very much. John Cliff, you are going to put your hand up here at one stage. Those photos you're talking about of the uh, early weavers' garage and barber shop, we have got those favours. Yep. yep. I think they're in the wiki they're store. In, yeah, right? so they can be, yeah. yeah, yeah. So we could furnish mm, you with those. Mm, mm. I learned of a new hairdresser yesterday in Gaul, but I, 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 have, I didn't do the current one, but it was Gusto's up on um, Carlton, Carlton Road. But there's a lot of these that do need to go in here uh, as a record of today's.
It's harder to put the, today's in than, than it is to put, put those in from, from decades and decades ago. But yeah, it's, it's anyone who wants to, I guess we can set up a, a blog or an opportunity to be able to, to contribute yeah. towards it. Yeah, just in, uh, on the end. In Steinwater's car yard, opposite the Baptist Church, Gene Winner. Gene Winner, yep. yep. There used to be a little alleyway alongside mm. where what we call Piccolo's yep. Blue House. There was an alleyway and there were little um, houses at the end. And she yeah. had a. Mm. My mum used to go there yeah. for yeah. Uh, I, I, I actually went there several times, and so did you. Yeah, yeah. Gene yeah. Winner gets a mention in the paper, but I, I'm assuming she was there, but I didn't know for sure. So there we are. We're, we're, yes. we're going to gain information all the time. Freely Cooch at Wilson, that was her acquaintance. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. I, knew, I knew Jean uh, up in, in the 90s. She lived up in the, in the Barossa, or she spent a lot of time in the Barossa. Uh, and she'd get her, no, she, she'd get her uh, uh, younger, younger friends uh, in their 80s and take them out for dinner. <laughs> she, she was a live one. Bruce. In the 1940s, Herb and Fred Grimm would go out to Rosalind College in the evening and cut the hair of the students. Okay. Yep. It's a service that was coming from Gawler, yep. as was Dr. Coverden, for example, mm -hmm. going out and yep. looking after yep. students. Yep. Out yep. there. That's a great great couple of lines in the in the story. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you put the name Shergis up there, um, that name is still going. Mm -hmm. uh, my mother, she's in the 90s, she gets her hair done at, at Shergis, Shergis. Yep. and that's down yep. at Croydon Park. Yep. Yep. She originally was in um, Arndale Shopping Centre, and now she's moved down there, and she's mm. been mm. doing it for many, yep. many years. Shergis was um, along, no, Shergis was alongside of us, or down the second shop from Todd Street. <laughs> yes. Yes. Then Shergis. Yes. Then yep, the bottom one. Next to us there was um, Schwartz. Yeah, Schwartz hairdressers up the top. Mike Dillson. Yep. Mike Dillson. Why are they called Consoria? Because they, they speak, they're a lot of talking. It's, it's just rabbiting on, yeah. About sometimes about nothing. <laughs> Tony, Tony. You said something about Martin's murder or father or suicide. What was that? Um, there was a young young lad from Tanunda. His father was the principal up there at the school. Came down to um, Gawler here to, to go to school and boarded at Martin's, which is in Short Street, just behind the, the Gawler East, well, the, the, the Gawler East Primary, as it used to be. Um, and uh, for whatever reason, um, he, uh, he snapped and got a gun and shot Keith's mother, and then shot himself. Where? Where, it, at, in, no. short, in Short Street, yeah. 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 Mm. There was a, a full-page um, full story in the Bunyip on that one. Um, and... Uh, he was he was buried in Adelaide at the same time as she was buried here, but his grave at um, Nailsworth has just got Jimmy on it. Just, that's all. He was just. His father came down. It was, uh, Keats was the name. He came down to be a principal, I think, at Gawler Primary School, and a and a very active participant in the community. I just looked at his name, and he was in everything down here. So uh, I guess the, the town didn't hold any grudges on on his parents, but uh, young Jimmy was he was the one. Right. Yeah, just a quickly a saying about barbers knowing, uh, talking to their customers and that. And it was always noted back in my days when I was doing the post office that uh, if the police wanted to know what was going on around town, they always saw the barber first. Yep. So, yep. You know, whether they pass information on or not. Mm. Mm. Yep. Yep. Yeah, mate. Just on the, on the subject of Saturday morning trading that came in. What do they do for weddings? Nothing. No, no, not really. Oh, that came in, come in a day or two before. Yeah, about men's head. Yeah. Men or no, ladies. Oh, ladies. Oh. Yeah, the ladies. No mention. No, no. no. Yeah. 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 I, uh, you're Brandon from the corner of Lindock uh, Road, uh, the chap who opened that one up, uh, a discovery came from the next village in Ireland that I, the town that I came from. Mm. He's in Capanda at the moment. Yeah, mm. 
I asked him to contribute if he had something, but he chose not to or didn't want to or couldn't or whatever. So, mm. 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 one more. Uh, Ian, serious question. Serious uh, question from Ian. When, uh, when you say you learned how to become a barber, what sort of things do you need to learn to cut someone's hair? I mean, what, obviously, you've got to learn. Yeah, yeah. I went to, to trade school in Adelaide. Um, the, being country, I went to um, the old TAFE in uh, Finner Street um, for the Tuesday morning, I think it was, to do theory, and then two or three blocks a year down in Adelaide for a fortnight, uh, which we did practice. And otherwise, it's just a potluck. If you were in the, in the shop at the wrong, wrong time, you got me. <laughs> <laughs> Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's pretty comprehensive, actually. They, they cover a whole lot of things um, in, in the hairdressing course. Hmm. Yeah. What about uh, looking at the diseases of the scalp? Yep, yep. So even that how important. Was yep, that? very much so. Yeah, skin, uh, skin and diseases, um, even down to uh, electri uh, electrical, because we're actually dealing with electrical clippers and that sort of thing. Um, and so that even like taking care with power and um, diseases um, and um, oh. Nothing about character, but it was all to do with the practical side of, of cutting cutting hair. The, the, oh, I can remember the barber that I went to um, before they had all this trade school. The apprentices were allowed to start, and then the experienced chap took over. That's what I did. Yep. 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 That's what I did for quite a for quite a while. Mm. So how far were you allowed to go? <laughs> depending how much Harold was talking to someone else. <laughs> <laughs> if, he, if he got carried away, I went quite. I went, I went all the way through, perhaps. But um, yeah, and, and some people are good teachers, and others aren't. And I'd say honestly that Harold wasn't a good teacher. Um, he, he wasn't. He wasn't a uh, nice enough bloke, but he wasn't a, an instructor, if you like. So I had to do a lot of lot of it on my own. But um, I, got, I got by. By after three years, I was able to run the shop. That's called the school of hard knocks. Last question. Mm. Yes. Harold Moran got that my dad started. Yep. Not, as, not, not as an apprentice. Mm. Showing him, yeah. Yep. Yep. And their dad practiced on when footballers. Mm. <laughs> 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 One of the questions I was going to ask Pauline Norton when I do get her uh, is uh, where did Keith start operating from? I knew that in, 90, in 25 he was a hairdresser in 2080 was on his own, but I'm not sure who he did his trade for, uh, with, or uh, how he actually um, learned. So uh, that's one of the one of the things that still needs to, to go in there. But uh, yeah, I'll just keep keep putting the, the contribution in. And, mm. There's a woman called Julie Gibbons, and she used to work for Shogus. You might want to come up to her. I can give you her name. Julie Gibbons. She used to work for Shogus. Okay, Shogus. Mm. Twelve months ago, I had an inkling that the history of hairdressing in Gawler would be interesting, and it sure was. Yeah. Well done, and uh, I'd now like to ask uh, Pat to uh, present a vote of thanks on behalf of the audience.